Hello and welcome to the Origins of Islam. After learning about the Syrian inter-Trinitarian Christians in the last episode, today we want to look at how these Christians are reflected in the Quran. But first, let's look at some of the context again. In the Sassanid Empire, Syrian Christians were not confronted with a majority of Hellenistic Christians, which means that they did not have to defend their own theology. And without the philosophical challenges coming from these Trinitarian Christians in the West, the anti-Trinitarian beliefs of these Christians could continue to live on for centuries. The theology of those Christians was still mostly based on the Old Testament. Son of God was an honorary title for these Christians and not to be taken literally. They used imagery rather than systematic definitions, which once again goes back to this lack of philosophical challenges. There simply was no need to develop a deep philosophical system. However, after 410 AD, Hellenistic ideas were forced upon the Church of the East with the Council of Ctesiphon, which means that within the Church of the East, this Syrian theology only survived in the gaps. For example, with an emphasis on a strict monotheism and a strict separation of the human and the divine natures of Jesus while still keeping a focus on proving oneself in the eyes of God. Beyond that, Trinitarian Christianity was, however, taking over the Church of the East. Now, the writers of the Quran, they rejected this Hellenization of their Syrian Christianity. Now, let's recap real quick what we've already learned about the Quran. The earliest Quranic texts were lectionaries, but the Quran also intends to be a new Arab book of Deuteronomy, teaching the right interpretation of the law in the tradition of Moses. The fundamental theology that the Quran teaches comes straight from pre nicene Syrian Christianity. In the previous episode, we've looked at the Logos, and the Logos is also something that exists in Islam. As with Christianity, there are many different translations for the term. Now, I'm going to quote some verses from the Quran, but instead of giving the regular translation, I'll reinsert the term Logos where appropriate. So, for example, in Surah 17:85, the spirit is the logos from my Lord, but you have only received little knowledge. Surah 16:2, he lets the angels descend with the spirit from his Lord upon his chosen servants. Surah 10:3, after the six days of creation, God sits on his throne, quote, in order to direct the logos, end quote. What we can see from these examples is that the Logos, the Spirit, the Angels, they are all instruments of forces emanating from the One God, just like we saw with Paul of Samosata. It's a strict monotheism in the rejection of the Trinity. Jesus was only a man inspired by Spirit and Logos. The theology is based on proving oneself, and salvation is achieved by following Jesus and by extension the law, instead of through the incarnation or crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus is the servant of God, or in Arabic, the Abdallah. And we have a Syrian eschatology where Jesus is very prominent as the judge at the end of days. In general, we can say that the so-called Meccan surahs read a lot like the preachings of early Syrian missionaries. The reception of the Old Testament, as well as Jewish Apocrypha, were likely also transmitted via Syrian Christianity and not Jews or Ebionites. The gospel used was the Dietesseron. We've already met that book in the last episode, but to sum it up real quick, the Dietesseron is a single gospel woven together from the four canonical gospels that we are nowadays familiar with. A plausible story for the allegation that Christians falsified scripture might be a reaction to Matthew, Mark, Luke and John being translated into Aramaic and taking over a scripture after 410 AD in the Persian Empire. Those anti-Trinitarians, they would have only known the Diatessaron and now suddenly those four Gospels come along. So it would have looked like to them that somebody falsified scripture because instead of the one Gospel that they were familiar with, now there were four different ones. In the Roman Empire, the Diatessaron Tesseron was being replaced starting in the 4th century, but the further east we go, the longer this process took. But it's not just the Syrian anti-Trinitarian form of Christianity that left its mark. The diverse Christian landscape of Persia is reflected in the Quran. We have, for example, Syrian polemics versus monophysite theology. We have harsh laws, restrictions for women, rules for fasting and prohibition of alcohol, which come from Christian Ancratite traditions. The anti-Judaism of the Ancratites is also reflected in the opposite of the Jews in the Quran and the motif that Jesus wasn't really crucified is a Docetist or Gnostic motif as we've also seen in a previous video. But how did contemporary Christian writers see the religion of the Arabs? I've picked three examples, three famous examples from three different time periods right after the Muslim takeover of the Near East. 
in what we can see is an evolution. The views of these Christians towards the religion of the Arabs changes over time. Let's start with Isoya III. He was patriarch of the Church of the East and as such the Eastern counterpart to the Pope in the West. Many letters from him still exist today and one of which is interesting for us right now. He wrote that letter before 659 AD, which means he wrote it in a time before there was a unified Arab Caliphate. The letter was written in response to another letter by the church in Nineveh. The congregation in Nineveh complained that the Arab rulers preferred Monophysites over the Nestorian church. The Hagarenes praise our faith, they honor our priests and saints, and they help the church and its convents. All in all, Isoyo III seems to have a very positive view of the new Arab rulers and he clearly doesn't talk about them like you would talk about somebody who brings in a new religion. Instead he underlines how supportive they are of the Christians and particularly the Nestorians. But then why did the church in Nineveh complain? The likely answer is rooted in the fact that there was no single caliphate yet and that local Arab rulers had control over different pieces of land. The Nineveh is very close to the region where Already for centuries the Arab Ghassanids ruled and we know that the Arab Ghassanids converted to monophysitism centuries before. So it seems plausible that Nineveh fell under the control of the Ghassanids after the chaos following the fall of the Persian Empire. In which case it would only be natural if the Monophysite Ghassanids supported Monophysite Christians in their lands. But they would have been the exception. This support of Monophysites would only have been a local phenomenon, which then explains why Isoya III answered in the way that he did. The next Christian writer we're going to look at is Anastasius Sinaita. He was abbot of St. Catherine's Monastery on the Sinai Peninsula, just like Isoya III. Anastasius wrote many letters, many of which survive today. Anastasius was a Catholic of his day and he instructed other Catholics on how to deal with the Arabs. He wrote that like us Catholics, the Arabs reject monophysitism. But he also said that when talking to the Arabs, one has to reject false assumptions they may have about us. Namely, that there are two gods, that God fathered a son in a carnal way, or that any created being in heaven or on earth may be worshipped. Now this sounds exactly like the kind of accusation somebody in the tradition of Paul of Samosata would throw at Trinitarian Christians. The third writer I want to highlight is John of Damascus. He was also a Catholic theologian who wrote before 750 AD. In his case, however, it's not letters that we're looking at, but a book against heresies, in which John describes the religion of the Arabs as a Christian heresy. He writes, They denounce us as idolaters because we venerate the cross. But we say to them, How do you rub on a rock underneath your dome and tenderly love the crack? Some of them say Abraham lay with Hagar on it. Others say that Abraham tied the she-camel to it when he went to kill Isaac. They venerate the rock and say it's the rock of Abraham. From this quote we can already see that there is now a growing tension. On the one hand the Arabs accuse other Christians of being idolaters and in return John of Damascus says that no it's the Arabs who are the actual idolaters. Then he goes on. Mahmed says that Christ is Logos and Spirit of God but created and his servant and that he was born of Mary the sister of Moses and Aaron without procreation. He says that the Logos of God and the Spirit entered Mary and she gave birth to Jesus the prophet and servant of God and he says that the Jews wanted to commit the sacrilege of crucifying him. After they taint him they did however only crucify his simulacrum. However Christ himself was not crucified and did not die as he says. God instead took him to himself in heaven because he loved him. Once again what you can see here is clearly a Christology that is in line with this anti-Trinitarian Syrian Christianity that we've looked at in the last episode. But John also noticed the Docetist motif that shines through in the crucifixion of Jesus. So to John, Arabs are Christian heretics, although we do have to be a bit careful with this passage because it's very possible that at least parts of it are later interpolations. That's the nature when dealing with a book against heresies. It gets copied for later generations to use. And if there's new material coming in, of course, they wouldn't write a new book. They just put it in the existing book. In case of John of Damascus, we know for a fact that parts of his writings against the religion of the Arabs are a later interpolation. We're not sure if this passage about Mahmoud is a later interpolation or not, but this is the kind of text where if it wasn't written by John of Damascus we would actually expect it to be an interpolation. So it's very possible that this is not written by John himself. But for our considerations that doesn't really matter because we can still see this evolution in how the Arabs religion is received by other Christians. 
Clearly, for Isoya III, the Arabs were a very positive development. He saw them as allies, maybe even as Nestorians like himself. At the very least, they were supportive of the Trinitarian Nestorian Church. Anastasius Sinaita, however, he already has a more nuanced view. For Anastasius, the religion of the Arabs is clearly distinct from his Catholic beliefs. And you can see that the misconceptions he wants to work against are those that we would also expect to find among these anti-Trinitarian Christians. But he also says that once those misconceptions are out of the way, one can come to an agreement. Now fast forward to John of Damascus and what we find is that clearly John sees Arabs as being heretical Christians, independent of whether or not individual passages of his text were later interpolations. So for John, there's no way of finding common ground with these heretics. Now, interesting to note here is that this change in perception seems to have happened at some point before 700 AD, and that coincides with the rule of Abd al-Malik. As we will see in later episodes, it was Abd al-Malik who really pushed this anti-Trinitarian Christianity, which also means, of course, that Trinitarian Christians living under his rule would reject this development. But be that as it may, we have no attestations of a new religion until well into the 9th century. Instead, we have writings from Christians who refer to the Arabs as Christians, at first mostly positively, but after Abd al-Malik more and more critical. Now let's have a quick look at the coins. Around 660, the first known coins with the Muhammad logo appear in Persis. These coins move westward over time. They first come up in Eastern Persia, where we find loads of them. Then we find them in Central Persia, and eventually we find the coins with the Muhammad motto, even as far west as Syria. This progression from east to west supports the idea of an eastern origin of the Quran. Under Abd al-Malik then new coins appear, coins which show a figure with a large sword and a text Kalfat Allah. These are traditionally interpreted to be the caliph of his time, the so-called standing caliph. In other words, it's believed that these coins depict Abd al-Malik himself. But on these coins there are typically no names. We only have the title Kalfat Allah, which translates to something along the lines of God's representative. And when looking at these coins in more detail, it becomes obvious that what we are looking at is an eschatological image. The sword that the figure carries is often depicted as a flaming sword, which is an eschatological image. So who is the person with the flaming sword at the end of times? Well, it's Jesus who returns as the judge to judge all of humanity. So Kal Fatala, the representative of God, is really Jesus. And these coins both appear in the east and the west of the caliphate. In general, what we see is that under the Arabs, coins were minted with all kinds of Christian symbolism on them. We have coins with crosses, with palm leaves, with fish, with lamb. Everything that is a non-Christian symbol has been put on coins by Arabs, which would be strange if they weren't Christian themselves. Now, in the east of the Caliphate, they've also kept some Zoroastrian imagery for a while. So for example, the typically eastern coins, which have these crescent moons along the rim of the coin, those crescent moons were Zoroastrian symbols. But even there, we found those same types of coins from the city of Merv, where those crescent moons were replaced with crosses. Now, in the West, the coins that were minted were still similar to the Byzantine coins. So like this so-called standing caliph that we see here on the screen, this motif is borrowed from Byzantine coins, where very often the emperor would have been depicted. On the rear of those Byzantine coins would always be a typical Byzantine cross. As we can see on this picture here, on the Arab coins, that cross disappears. Traditionally, this is seen as evidence for a new religion, the rejection of the cross. But in reality, the Byzantine cross was a symbol of a competing form of Christianity. And not just that, it was also the symbol of a competing empire. So there were both religious and political grounds to get rid of these crosses. Instead, what the Arabs put on their coins was the so-called Ega Sahaduta, the mount of stones raised as witness between Jacob and Laban, called by Jacob in Hebrew, Galid. So we've exchanged one biblical motif for another one. And something else we need to keep in mind here is, of course, that the cross in general played a much smaller role in Eastern variants of Christianity than in the West, because as we've seen before, salvation came from following in the footsteps of Jesus and not through his crucifixion. And with that, we're at the end for today and also at the end of the third part of my presentation. So let's summarize what we've learned here. 
An anti-Trinitarian Christology was widespread in Syria and its core beliefs were that Jesus was just a man and that salvation is achieved by emulating Jesus and following the law. In Western Syria, the Trinitarian view won out. In Eastern Syria and the Christian enclaves in Persia, the old anti-Trinitarian view survived. The Quran is the product of these anti-Trinitarian Christians. In the next part, we will look at how this heretical form of Christianity evolved into a new religion. Until then, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.